This is the third and final installment in our recent technical discussion series with this guy, Tom Peterson, an engineer who's worked at a couple of the big silicon makers in the industry and most recently Intel. In this video, we'll be distilling the incredibly complicated topic of video playback, compression, and media encode and decode into the most basic parts. And video has to be encoded because you'll blow up the planet. <laughs> and because we don't want you to blow up the planet, right. we have to encode it, which means compress it. And there are times in this video where I have absolutely no idea what's going on. We're going to do a 2D discrete cosine transform, but it is left as an exercise for the reader. Yeah, I'll exactly. Right now. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to punt on this. Although some of it is easier to understand, like the fact that YouTube has absolutely no business working with the insane amount of video it handles on a daily basis. If you just look at YouTube, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> it, YouTube nice. would generate 155 petabits per second, which is 130 times the total global internet bandwidth. Yes. Except what makes it all possible for websites like YouTube is the technologies. And that's what we're talking about today. And these apply basically agnostically across all of the hardware vendors. We'll do our best to facilitate the sharing of the knowledge that Tom brought with him to the show, following our recent discussion of how drivers work and what optimization means for games alongside the topic of simulation time error in gaming. Those are our previous two videos. This video will help give a beginner to intermediate understanding of how digital media actually works. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace, and visiting squarespace.com slash gamersnexus will give you 10% off your first purchase with them. We've built a number of our own websites with Squarespace, where we list catastrophic PC hardware failures to inform subscribers of those failures. We also built our store website with Squarespace using its built-in e-commerce tools, and of course, we built a website for our CEO, Snowflake, because she demanded our audience know who really runs the show. Get to the core of your idea and spend less time on web design by signing up at squarespace.com slash gamersnexus or click the link below. Hey everyone, we're back with Tom Peterson from Intel. And we did a video recently about drivers and what they are and what optimization. All the busy work that we do. Yeah, uh, busy works. Not busy work. A little All bit that of great an, stuff. Yeah. All that great stuff they do. A little bit of an undersell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and now we're going to talk about uh, some of the actually topics I'm not very familiar with. So this is going to be going over some media encode, decode uh, features, but also starting with a block diagram of Alchemist. So yeah. we'll kind of cover some of those topics. But when I, I asked Tom what this one is about, he said, uh, everybody knows about this part, <laughs> but we got the these media. These guys, yeah. these guys over here, exactly. So this is the uh, Alchemist 512 die, which is used on 770 and 750. And these are our render slices, which do all the graphics. We just got done talking about all the vector and matrix and how this is doing graphics. Right. But all the while, these little media engines have been sitting over here doing their thing. Effectively, this is kind of a visual of what is within the silicon. Yeah. Is it just a containerization of terminology, or is there an actual physical hardware uh, like separation? Yeah. Going so on? there is replication. Mm -hmm. So if you if you're designing the layout of this chip, you'll see there's a block that looks very much like an XE core array. There's actually a block that looks like the vector matrix unit combo. And then you would kind of take that and split down four of them mm -hmm. with some other stuff, and that becomes a block. And then you put down eight of those, and you've got more array. So there's both a containerization for logical, like, how do I talk about things? But there right. is a construction you know, uh, component as well. We have a, a, a full die. Mm -hmm. That would be a perfect die. You call it a 512. That's 770. But then if one of these has a defect in it, you can turn this off entirely with no uh, impact on the rest of it. There's no power leakage. There's, you know, mm -hmm. This can be completely broken, and we can isolate it entirely. And so the remaining die represented a down bin of that skew. Which allows uh, you to save the silicon. Which allows you to save the silicon. Right. And if you think about it, these dies are big, mm -hmm. and, and silicon errors are, you know, happen so we by by doing this redundancy stuff and that happens both at the block level and at the sub block level so mm -hmm. inside of a lot of these blocks there's extra components built in okay. so that if one gets fried you can switch some circuits right. and like swap in the replacement piece okay cool. so that's actually much more common it's like there's, the extra screws when you take something it, apart it's like uh, the old nvidia boards yeah exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah right yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so this is this is effectively built with redundancy in mind mm. and it it has has downbinning and repair built in. Okay. Yeah. So then let's get over to the, the media stuff. This is the full disclosure for the audience. I am not very well versed in 
uh, encode, decode, AV1, H264, four, five. So I'm coming into this with very little knowledge. Uh, I will play the role of facilitating Thank conversation. You. Thank you. Yeah. And I will play the role of a recently born <laughs> media aware person. OK, we'll got it. I want to, uh, before I even begin, say thanks to James Holland for all his help, uh, because he's our media architect. And okay. he's, he's basically helped me get to the point where I can talk about this uh, cool. coherently. Great. OK, yeah. so anything that I say wrong is actually not on me. Right. It's on James. OK, Perfect. there we go. Got Here it. we go. <laughs> All right, so what is media is the way I start, uh -huh. right? I think we both know the answer to this. Um, media is not just one picture, it's a whole collection of pictures. And this is how animation happens, right? Mm -hmm. If you go to the movies, you see picture after picture, each one's a little different, and that's motion, right? right. Media is that series of pictures plus uh, audio right next to it. And these are both put into one file together called mm -hmm. a container, and that might be an MP4 file or a movie file. So think of it as a bunch of pictures and audio all together. Okay, now um, each picture is made up of pixels, and pixels are effectively little dots, right? Mm -hmm. You get a lot of them, you get a grid, and each dot is made up of three colors, red, green, and blue, right? So you can get uh, millions of colors by combining red, green, and blue, and that's one pixel. Each color can be 8 bits, 10 bits, or 12 bits, which is kind of saying, how many possible colors do I want for red? It might be 16 million if you're 8-bit, all the way up to 68 billion if you're 12-bit. So this is, again, something that people often hear of, which is 10-bit color. Uh, or yeah, I was going to say, you see this appear in camera marketing. Yeah, example. exactly, yeah. exactly. And it's talking about what's the resolution in the color space of a particular channel. Mm. Okay, so you can see, uh, if you're doing 8-bit color, you need 3 bytes per pixel. If you're doing 12-bit color, you need 6 bytes per pixel. Right. Okay? Now, that feeds into what we call the media format <laughs> formula. I made that up yesterday. And the way it works is width times height. <laughs> times data per pixel, which is that 6-3 uh -huh. thing, times frames per second, times duration is data size. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do is fill this in with a few examples. So if you're so doing... This is why, I guess, for, for example, when we're rendering a video, you can normally approximate pretty well the, the end size. Be. You know, yeah, you right, know, yeah. Right. So if you, if you just take 1080p as an example, 19 by 10, 3 bytes uh, per pixel, mm -hmm. 30 frames a second times 60 gives you 11.2 gigabytes per minute. A lot of data coming from generating video. Okay, and that means that if you just look at YouTube, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> at YouTube nice. would generate 155 petabits per second, which is 130 times the total global internet yes, bandwidth. I, yes, okay? I'm, so I'm YouTube, sorry to YouTube. <laughs> YouTube <laughs> is sucking down the, the, the bits, yeah. uh, and it would be 155 petabits. So we need compression. Okay, and yeah. that's really what we're talking about because compression takes all of that data that you would have had and squeezes it way down. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, this is, I guess, as you're saying, physically impossible. Physically to, impossible. To accommodate. You would not have a YouTube business. Right. It'd be impossible. <laughs> yeah. Right. All right. So how does this happen? Um, encoding is basically very similar uh, over the years, and it is pretty much five phases. Starts off with color space conversion, mm. then does something called spatial and temporal redundancy removal then a, a generating a decoding error, and then quantization and symbol coding. How, how is this process defined? Is this defined by, uh, by the industry at large? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there, the way to think about it is um, this, this sort of discipline has mm -hmm. evolved over decades. Right. And um, there are committees that form uh, standards mm -hmm. around like a series of different types of conversions. Okay. And, and those standards become AV1, HEVC, ABC, right. and this is the process that they use to do. This is like an abstraction of a specific code. This is just video, mm. and video has to be encoded because you'll blow up the planet, <laughs> right. and because we don't want you to blow up the planet, right. we have to encode it, which means compress it. Uh -huh. Okay, and it, it's got the five phases that I'll talk about in a little bit of detail. Sure. All right, well, the first one I want to dive into is color space conversion, mm. okay? So it's a really cool topic. It has to do with how human eyes see, right? Mm. So let's just take a look. So to begin with, pixels are made up of three different colors, our red, green, and blue in this case, but the truth is it doesn't have to be that way. For example, your eyes, have sensors in them that are called rods and cones. Mm. And it turns out rods see luminance and cones see red, green, and blue. Okay, okay so cones see color, rods see black and white. And if you think about it, your eyes, uh, because of the way your, your cones are working, mm -hmm. are more sensitive to certain frequencies, which really tr means that brightness is the thing that you're most sensitive to and uh, colors is less sensitive. 
Okay. okay, that's all because of the physiology of your eye. Right. So we're going to take advantage of that in the first step, and we're going to change the way we code color. Instead of red, green, and blue, we're going to use something called luma and chrominance, which is YUV. Okay. And this is the same information, it's just coded as black and white, magenta, and, and, and a green. Okay. So it's pretty cool. And this means that um, we can actually take advantage of the fact that you can't really see these colors very much, and we can compress them. Okay, so that's what's going to happen here. We're going to start off in the saying. So we're zooming in. Yeah, we're here, zooming in on our okay. toucan, and you can see this little grid here. And it, these would be the colors for that block in red, green, and blue. Uh -huh. But okay. if I coded it up in luma and chrominance, it would look like this. You could kind of see there's a hard edge and there's mostly gray, and then you can see a little bit of color down here. So now, as we compress, we have something called 444, which means we're going to use all of the components of all the chroma and the luminance, and you get exactly the same thing as the RGB. In this case, we're going to do what's called 422, which means we're going to use less of the uh, y, the U and the V is this, channels. Is this an amount of bits? Yeah, it's each? how many bits am I using like to to talk to store chroma? So, so in other words, is it four bits, four bits, four bits, mm -hmm. and then 422? Yep, 422. Okay, so right. four bits for luminance, two bits for U, and two bits for V. And then on the far right, you have zero bits for zero bits for there's uh, four bits for uh, luminance and two bits for chroma. Okay. So, yeah. Got it. Okay. And so if you think about it, the difference between this picture and this picture and this picture is actually very slight. Mm -hmm. But just doing this chroma convergence, we saved up to 2x compression. And you'll see this uh, show up a lot on media formats. And so I guess when uh, this doesn't happen as much anymore, but especially in the older days of, say, YouTube, where well, compression's still not great, but on YouTube, <laughs> that's not your fault, though. I know. We're getting <laughs> but, there. We're getting there. But we're getting to the fans your fault, or, mm -hmm. or we're getting to YouTube. There's a lot of things that are my fault, man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, especially in the earlier days, though, you see that sort of flicker behavior when the compression is, I'll, I'll just yes. call it bad. Yes. Um, so is that from, is it an issue of, of not having enough data to reconstruct something, yes. or is okay. Yes, and actually, you'll, that'll be, that'll make more sense when we talk about the sort of the temporal stuff. Okay. Right, because this is right now chroma. You would see the chroma problem where you'll see something look purple when it shouldn't look purple, mm. but that's less visible than the thing that really looks like the thing's broken where you see all that blocking. Yeah. That blocking is from the temporal stuff. Okay. Yeah. So that brings us to spatial and temporal redundancy search. So after chroma downsampling, mm -hmm. we've already reduced it be, by maybe up to 2x. And so now we're going to do something really cool. You're taking advantage of the fact that this is a movie. And there's a lot of coherence from frame to frame to frame. So maybe we, we save a full frame initially, but for subsequent frames, we're only going to save things that change. Okay. And so think of it as motion vectors are calculated by looking at the second frame compared to the first frame, and then saying, oh, you know what, I saw the sun went down a little bit, so I will save a motion vector, almost like an instruction. So to generate frame two, remember, move these pixels from point A to point B, and we'll just save that. Same for frame three and same for same. So does that frame allow four. avoiding recalculating everything else? Well, it basically says I don't need to store any of these pixels, okay. right? Because I'm going to take the original frame and I'm going to generate this new frame by just applying a sort of an algorithmic manipulation. I see. Right? So we can throw these millions of pixels out and just remember motion vector, motion vector, motion vector. Okay, now the problem with this is it's not perfect. So we have more work to do, which is called correcting terms. So the idea here is that we've now got our instruction set, which has allowed us to compress by maybe up to 20 times, but we know we have errors. So what I want to do when we generate the correction term is we're going to generate the image that we would just using our instruction set, and I'm going to compare it to the original. I'm going to take the difference. Uh, I guess this, this conversation reminds me of, I think the first time I encountered any kind of compression uh, education. Uh -huh. It may have been you, but it was from <laughs> NVIDIA talking about uh, Delta color compression. Yes, it was not me. Probably okay. Jonah. Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe it was Jonah. Yeah, yeah. But some of this is starting to sound familiar to that. Yeah, where it's you're, very similar. You're trying to focus on just the thing that changes. Just the differences, yeah. Okay. So in this case, we, we uh, use the, you know, we've got our instruction set. We've got the prior frame. And now we generate that new frame using just the instruction set, compare it to the real frame, and now we have what's called a residual. And the residual is just like a collection of bits that weren't quite correctly moved because, you know, you're using an instruction set. It's not going to be perfect pixels. Okay, so residual and kind of the literal use of the yeah, term. Yeah, it's the residual error. And if you apply it by adding it back to your original image or adding it to the generated image, 
you'll get back to the, exactly the original image. Got it. Okay, so now, after we've generated the residual, we have more work to do. Now, this is where I'm going to start getting a little fuzzy. Okay. Okay, because <laughs> okay. This, this whole topic here, no matter how much James has talked to me, I cannot explain it yet. Okay, it's sure. called It's called uh, frequency quantization. And what actually happens is we convert it from, this is now just working on the residual, right? Because mm -hmm. we're going to compress, that's the only thing. Up here, we're just going to remember the instruction set. Now we're compressing the residual to save it along with the instruction set. Okay, so to quantize, you're going to think of it like we're going to convert it to the frequency space, mm -hmm. and then we're going to remove high frequency components. So I will show you a picture, and then I'm going to say there's some math here, uh -huh. and there's a couple <laughs> pictures. Yeah. We're going to do a 2D discrete cosine transform, but it is left as an exercise for the reader. It. Yeah, I'll start exactly. On it right now. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to punt on this. <laughs> uh, but basically, think about it as some fancy stuff happens. There's some quantization mm -hmm. happening. Can you give me the, the, the basics? Yes. Oh, what the hell is this? What is that? Okay, <laughs> yeah. Here, here's the basics. <clears throat> so, first of all, let me start by saying you don't really do this on the full picture, you do it on the residual. Mm -hmm. But this is very confusing if you just show a residual. So, this this would just be a few bits. This is right? to make it a little easier to understand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But imagine that's the residual. What this is representing is the components of the frequency space that have a non-blank pixel, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so you would say if there's a pixel down here, that's if there's a spot down here that's got a strong value, it means there's a, a large flat area in the picture. So is this a location for location map? No. no. It, it's more okay. like these represent different frequencies. So it's more of an X, Y axis. Yeah, X, Y and frequencies. Okay. Right, this is X, Y in pixels. Uh -huh. This is a frequency going up this way, higher frequency going these directions. Got it. Okay, so these pixels out here are really representing real high frequency noise. Mm. And these pixels down here are representing sort of flat, black, low noise spaces. I see. So what we do is we take these pixels up here and we say, throw them out. Or, or use them less, right? Got it. And that's how you get this picture which says, focusing our energy down here, reducing the pixels out here, means we can reconstruct effectively the same residual but not store as much information. That's uh, called yeah, quantization. Okay. Uh -huh. And we actually end up storing this, not that. Got it. Right? Okay. So that's that's so we don't really store the residual. We store a frequency uh, kind of view compressed, quantized. Yeah, I mean if you don't have a compressed video, mm. um, back in the day you would see hitchy video playback mm. or you'd see blocking playback, right? right? And and on the blocking playback, you can think about what's happening is I can't I can't get through this entire file. Let me flick forward one. I can't get through this whole five phase thing in time to update my frame in that 16 milliseconds window. And because I can't get through it, something got dropped. I see. And most of the time that thing that got dropped is the application of the correction term back to the decode. Right? So you'll see sometimes the, you, know, you can tell a motion vector thing didn't get moved mm -hmm. or the instruction set that's generating that drive image didn't really get played back. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we're down to our last step, which is called symbol coding. And again, I don't want to get too deep into this, but there's something called Huffman encoding, which is mm -hmm. really cool. And it, bas it basically says for a collection of bits that represents the residual in the frequency space, let's uh, find the bits that are most common in a pattern, mm -hmm. and we'll give that a code that is smaller, right? And so you give the smallest codes to the patterns that are most common, and by doing that across your entire image, you can compress it. That's called a Huffman encoding. And, and earlier when we were, this is the one I felt like I was starting to, at least at a, a very rudimentary level, yeah. I was starting to kind of understand parts of that where um, we were talking about taking a, a shorthand binary as a reference for, I call it a, a long form binary or something. Yes, yes. And so is this, is this lookup table or reference fixed? Is it it, it, it is. It's, it's calculated you know, by the standard committee. Mm -hmm. And basically you're going to say, uh, we've looked at a lot of images, we've looked at a lot of movies, these are the residuals that occur, and so the frequency distribution of the patterns and the residuals is X, mm -hmm. which means that this is the Huffman tree that we want to use. So is, is the purpose of it to just avoid uh, pushing through significantly longer binary? Yeah, because okay. you're going to get 2x compression just mm -hmm. by this process, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's you know, really significant. And, and what's really cool about it, it's lossless. Because you're because you're you know every encoding has a precise decode. Yeah. You're not losing anything by doing this. Right. You're just doing a sort of a changing the symbolic storage, right? But this is cool, <laughs> and now we're done. That's yeah. how that's cool. how encoding works. And what it does is it takes a an input which is usually large, high mm -hmm. bandwidth 
goes through this process, and now you're down from gigabytes down to megabytes. Decoding is just the opposite, mm -hmm. right? So you're going to take the data stream, and you're going to expand it back up into the image, and you, you, know, you kind of start by undoing that symbol. You're doing symbol decoding. Then you're going to do your spatial kind of inverse, and it all exactly follows backwards. Right, okay. That's the story. <laughs> How do you feel? I feel like I have a lot to learn yeah. <laughs> in this space. Yeah. So what uh, I thought I'd do is take this yeah. and apply it to us. Because everything that I did so far has nothing, I mean, it has a lot to do with us because we contribute to those standards. It's generally But it's, it's the same for everybody. Same yeah. for everybody. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, so what's, what's the story here? Um, so I thought we'd walk through how do you take that function that you need to do, which is encode and decode, mm -hmm. and build hardware to do it well. Okay. And in, Intel's had a long history with QuickSync and others of mm -hmm. being incredibly good with media processing. Yeah. And that same legacy is now part of ARC. So I Quick think we actually is is the reason that we use Intel gaming parts rather than any kind of HEDT. Is for, that right? Yeah, for the video production machines because Premiere is so accelerated by the IGP yeah, with yeah, QuickSync yeah. that it will, if I have like a, a 4080 and a 4090 in a machine and one has the IGP disabled, uh -huh. that one's going to do worse no matter which card uh -huh. it is. It's pretty amazing. Which is, yeah. So, so. it's the same guts that I'm mm. about to show you what, what it really right. does, right? So it's the same both in our integrated and discrete. So we're showing you this is in the discrete, the So this is that engine. block that was on the right. Exactly, the, the that original. one that was so ignored for so <laughs> right, long. Right. It's now having its moment yeah. out here. Right, so the media engine has two MFX engines and a bunch of fixed function stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The MFX has the encoder and decoder, which we just talked about, is kind of this pipeline, right? So now if you look at my names, they actually match pretty closely the phases of yeah. this pipeline. And this is all fairly fixed function. Okay. So that means we're doing a very low power, very high performance, directly decoding and encoding uh, in hardware. Right. And so you're taking actual, this, we're now looking at actual silicon real estate yeah, to silicon represent real fixed estate. function hardware. Okay. Exactly. And, and you can think about, you know, some of these functions are actually pretty heavyweight. So the amount of... This uh, is like almost exactly the same name. I guess inverse quant is quantization. Yep, yep. Correction yeah, terms. Yeah, correction right? terms you want And what's through. happening here is this is that feedback I talked about where as you're doing encoding, you generated your instruction set mm. here, and then you need to actually run that image through the decoder okay. to get like what would my image look like if I just did my instruction set, and then you use that to do your uh, error term. Right, so that's why this thing kind of feeds back and forth does, across. Does all of this, does this process get its own driver or part of a driver? There is a media driver, okay. um, and I'll show you a media stack in a little bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that's cool. I, I love the way this picture matches the actual functions of, right. of decoding and encoding. Um, if you dig into this a little bit, you can see that it's attached to memory, obviously, and we do see take uncompressed in and mm. stick compressed out. Okay. Uh, if you want to do decode, it's exactly the opposite, compressed in, uncompressed out. And we also do transcode, which is the same idea you do, uh, obviously, decode, and then you get an uncompressed image that you run back through ENCODE, and this is supported in a bunch of different apps. Right. It's right. pretty cool. Um, I would also say uh, we do both. We have two MFXs, which means we can do dual decode and ENCODE. Right? Okay. So yeah. that, if you, as an example, there's a thing called a group of pictures or tile split. So you basically say, I want to ENCODE a video, split it up by scene or split it up in some other way, send one to one MF MFX and the other to another, and you can basically double your, your speed. Okay, yeah, I see. Pretty cool. For the same video? For the same video. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, lastly, this is the software stack. Mm. Now, the software stack is pr a little bit bigger than the 3D software stack because applications up here like Handbrake or Adobe or you, you name it, yeah. there's tons of them. They have multiple choices of frameworks to, to work. There's Obviously, something called FFmpeg, which mm. is uh, a multiple you know, source open and available. There's GStreamer. HMFT is Microsoft's version. Uh, VPL is from Intel. So uh, there's just so many choices that people make today. But at the end of the day, they all go to either our VPL runtime okay. or Microsoft's D3D runtime. And then Vulkan's off on the and side. And Vulkan's yeah. off on the side. And the way to think about that, all of these runtimes are going to call into, just like on DirectX, there's a UMD a KMD firmware in the GPU. Yeah, this this slide is getting a little closer. Just things I'm familiar with, just if for no nothing else than just name. Yeah, because uh, this is kind of what we interact with. Yes. on the you know uh, video side for mm -hmm. our, our stuff. So mm. compression's all invisible to us. Compression's yeah. magic. <laughs> yeah, I, I swear to God, I never thought about it until like five weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> right, and it's amazing. Uh, so then this section we talked about a little bit in our other video, which is just the how do drivers work? What do they do? 
And user mode driver, kernel mode driver, and graphics firmware, those are blocks that we talked about in that one. Yep. And that's applicable to uh, I mean, running games as well. Yeah, so. it's a different UMD. This is the media driver. Mm -hmm. But think of it as, you know, what types of things does it do? It does, like, how do I program the hardware mm. to do those functions, depending on the APIs that were called from the runtime. Right. So, right. you know, it, it would basically be programming the MFX mm -hmm. blocks to do the right thing. Do you have anything else related to media you want to go over? Uh, not at this time. <laughs> okay. Not at this time. This is a good description of media. I mean, obviously, the reason I'm here to talk about it is because we do a really good job on it. Sure. So I would say at, at any time you want to run some performance benchmarks, feel free. <laughs> right. We've got a lot of good hardware in there that does some good things, but uh, yeah, we're pretty excited about it. So that's the media overview for uh, compression, decompression, and uh, the human eye. So thank you, Tom, for, yeah, you're the, welcome. for you're the anatomy welcome. Cool. lesson as well. <laughs> and uh, we've got the driver video, and then the last one we're doing uh, is Present Mon 2, which that's exciting for us because it relates to benchmarking. So check back for those. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.